Uh, welcome back after the break and to the next session. So we will jump straight away to our first speaker of the session, who is Adam Antebi from the Max Planck, Planck Institute in Cologne, and he is here in person. Great. Can everyone hear me? Okay, very good. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you to all the organizers who put together this really terrific meeting. It's just amazing to be here in person again. Actually, I think these hybrid meetings kind of work. I think there, there's a good niche here for, for having people abroad and having people here. So I think we found something. So, um, so aging is something I think that we can all appreciate here. And it's really vexed humankind for millennia. And this really stems from our fear of our own mortality to some extent. And we want to maintain health as long as we can. And the question is, what can we do about it? And uh, work from model systems over the last several decades have revealed that a lifespan can be regulated by single gene mutations, as Felipe uh, told us earlier. And many of these single gene mutants were first found in model organisms, such as my favorite, the worm. And, uh, and they identify uh, conserved metabolic signaling pathways that can regulate animal lifespans. And these include uh, reduced insulin IGF signaling, reduced mTOR signaling, reduced signals from the reproductive system, in this case triggered by reduced notch signaling in the worm, models of dietary restriction, and reduced mitochondrial function. And uh, these pathways are considered canonical longevity pathways, um, and they apparently regulate lifespan in different species, so they're really very much illuminating from an evolutionary perspective. Now, uh, from a genetic perspective, these pathways have been perceived to regulate lifespan somewhat independently from one another, and that's based on the finding that distinct sets of transcription factors are mediating their outputs. Sorry about that. Um, for example, uh, DAF16 is mediating the output for insulin signaling. Uh, we've uh, worked on a number of nuclear receptors that, uh, that um, are involved in regulating uh, uh, germline signaling as well as diet restriction. Um, but we've become fascinated with, I think, a more profound question over the last few years, and that is, are there convergent mechanisms? Are there convergent regulators? Are there convergent metabolic modules that work across these pathways? And we think this is an important question because we can get at the heart of longevity. And in answer to those questions, we've identified a number of different modules, including a, a, a number of helix loop helix transcription factors that work in a tight regulatory network, including Mondo, MaxLike, and TFEB. Uh, so our lab and other labs have shown that a knockdown of these transcription factors can abolish the extension of life in, in these various pathways to different extents. We've also identified the nucleolus as an important focal point of regulation and shown that small nucleoli are a cellular hallmark of longevity, and this works predominantly through a regulatory protein called TRIM2, which downregulates fibrillarin and other nucleolar proteins to regulate ribogenesis and perhaps uh, protein fidelity. Today, I want to tell you about our studies on metabolomics and how we've identified metabolic modules which may act at the convergence of many of these longevity pathways, namely uh, folate and methionine metabolism. And so this was really the work of an incredibly talented postdoc in my lab, Andrea Anabal. He's an analytical chemist, and he came to my lab, and I turned him into a biologist. And um, our idea was to simply do metabolomic profiling of these various long-lived strains and ask what metabolites were up or down regulated relative to wild type, and then assign those metabolites to metabolic pathways and then manipulate those pathways through genetics and metabolite supplementation to see whether they could impact the lifespan. And so, uh, and the power of this system really stems from the fact that we're doing everything on, on a singular platform. And we can really compare across the genotypes. So this just shows you a heat map of uh, the soluble metabolites that we examined. And uh, the, uh, the main genotypes that we uh, scanned were this uh, reproductive signaling axis, insulin signaling, mitochondrial function, and diet restriction. And, uh, and you can see um, there are 
metabolites that go up in red or down in blue, but our attention was very quickly drawn to this module of folate and methionine metabolism since we saw a robust, oh boy, very sensitive here. Um, we saw a very robust uh, down regulation of 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate shown at the top line and uh, also a robust downregulation of s methionine across all four of those genotypes. And so we decided to pursue this further. This was also supported by some uh, computational analysis that we did as well. So we decided to do targeted metabolomics and look at the folate cycle in more detail. So just to remind you, the folate cycle carries out one carbon metabolism. It's involved in transferring methyl, methylene, and formal groups for various biochemical reactions. And this is important, for example, in methionine synthesis, in thymidylate synthesis for DNA synthesis. It's also involved in, produ in producing NADPH for biosynthetic reactions, in purine synthesis, and it also affects amino acid pools since serine is the main methyl donor. And when we did targeted metabolomics, I think you can see that when we looked across genotypes, we could see three or four of those genotypes either down in blue or red up. And our, again, we could validate our findings that 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate was, uh, was robustly downregulated. Do might you have a pointer? Because this is this seems quite sensitive. And no. Every time I, I'll just have to be very. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. So uh, so five methyl tetrahydrofolate it disappeared. It is, was down in, in, in three out of the four genotypes. And so what Andrea did then was to perform RNAi against the various enzymes of this pathway shown here in green. And he could show that dihydrofolate reductase, one of the first enzymes in the pathway, uh, was, uh, was very uh, efficient at uh, extending the lifespan. We also saw this with thymidylate synthase, and these are the two rate-limiting enzymes within the folate cycle. So uh, I think you can see in black is a wild-type lifespan in the worm. They live about 20 days, and in blue and in orange, um, we, we see, sorry about this, I think I'll just speak it through. In blue and orange, you can see uh, about a 20% increase in the lifespan. In red, you see uh, the DAF2, the insulin receptor mutant, can extend lifespan by about, uh, about twofold. So this, this was a very robust finding, and we focused on DHFR1 in particular uh, and asked what, does the, what, what impact does DHFR1 knockdown have on folate cycle intermediates? And shown uh, in the lower panel, uh, in orange are the, the folate cycle intermediates as in the DHFR1 knockdown. In black are those uh, intermediates in wild type. And I think you can see that folic acid itself accumulates, but all the other components, all the components of the folate cycle itself are downregulated. And furthermore, if we supplement with this 5-methyl THF, uh, just simply five, uh, 10 nanomolar of this compound could restore the folate pool, but had no effect on folic acid itself. And so then we asked, is longevity due to the accumulation of folic acid, or is it due to the depletion of the folate pool? And if we supplement the DHFR1 RNAi-treated animals with 5-methyl-THF, we could reverse this longevity, do this, um, but not with folic acid. And so this suggested that low levels of DHFR1 and low levels of 5-methyl-THF promote long life, and that these were limiting for lifespan. Furthermore, we, uh, supplementing with 5-methyl-THF had no effect on wild types, so it wasn't a toxic effect of this compound, but rather that we were re replenishing the folate pool. So what about uh, other aspects uh, uh, than lifespan? What about health span? In this case, we used a model of proteotoxic challenge. And this, uh, this is a model of polyglutamine repeat disease, which causes progressive toxicity. And in, uh, in black, you can see that animals are uh, mostly uh, lose their motility by midlife. Um, but when we knock down DHFR1, this motility is maintained. 
Uh, they also accumulate aggregates, but these aggregates are dissipated in DHFR1 knockdown, and all of these features are reversed simply by feeding the metabolite 5-methyl-THF. So our conclusion is DHFR1 reduction actually enhances health and life. Now, the way we started with these experiments was we, we were looking at these canonical longevity pathways, and so we wondered whether they too showed any kind of uh, effect when we supplemented with 5-methyl-THF. And indeed, um, when we supplement the insulin receptor mutant, DAF2, with 5-methyl-THF, we shorten the lifespan, as we do with ISP1. And so uh, this suggests that at least one vectoral component of their longevity is mediated through 5-methyl-THF. And again, um, we don't see any impact on, on the lifespan. If this is true, we might expect that these pathways play some role in regulating the folate cycle. And indeed, we see that both DAF2 and ISP1 downregulate DHFR1 uh, at the level of mRNA. And so this leads to a kind of simplistic model that reduced insulin signaling or reduced mitochondrial function downregulates DHFR1, downregulates down this metabolite production, and thereby promotes longevity. So what's the mechanism? Well, uh, here we, we surmise that it could be working through methionine restriction, since one of the main roles of the folate cycle is to produce methionine through 5-methyl-THF condensing with homocysteine through the actions of methionine synthase, or METHER1, in the worm. And so uh, if this is true, one might expect that the products of this enzyme, namely methionine and s adenosyl methionine, would be depleted upon DHFR1 knockdown, and the products uh, and the uh, precursors would accumulate. And that's exactly what we see shown in orange. The methionine, s adenosyl methionine, are down, and homocysteine and s adenosyl, uh, uh, or adenosyl homocysteine are accumulating, and this is dependent on 5-methyl-THF. Furthermore, we could show that, um, that methionine synthase and DHFR1 knockdown have similar phenotypes with respect to the metabolome. That is, they deplete methionine and s adenosyl methionine. They accumulate homocysteine. They also have a number of other metabolites that they share in common shown through in this Venn diagram. And furthermore, uh, the transcripts, uh, we, we noted that there are certain transcripts that are regulated in common, which identify transcripts that have been shown by others to be involved in methionine um, restriction. So we think uh, the final proof of the pudding really comes from methionine supplementation itself. Um, DHFR1 RNAi-induced longevity is dependent upon methionine in a dose-dependent manner. Uh, if we supplement 20 or 40 millimolar methionine, we completely abolish the lifespan. Uh, we have no effect on wild type, shown in black, and this really suggests that we're replenishing the methionine pool uh, and not causing a, a general toxicity. So, um, so th this is really striking. Uh, it seems like methionine restriction is one of the main underlying factors in various longevity pathways, but of course we weren't the first to discover methionine restriction. Many labs have been working on this and various aspects that emanate from methionine restriction for years, but I think this really highlights how important and central it is to many of these longevity pathways. Um, just a, a little aside here, I've just spent a good deal of time trying to convince you that methionine restriction is the underlying cause, but the metabolome is very much interconnected, and we, we actually see other changes that seem peripheral to methionine restriction that are also consistent. So, for example, we see that NMN is also elevated in a DHFR1 RNAi-dependent manner, as is alpha-ketoglutarate. These are pro-longevity metabolites, and they too are reversed by 5-methyl-THF uh, supplementation. So uh, apparently uh, there are long-range interactions that we would really like to understand now. The question arises, is this uh, conserved across evolution? And indeed, uh, here we were fortunate to collaborate with Linda Partridge within our institute, and we can show that both in reduced insulin signaling in worms and in mice, that 5-methyl-THF and s adenosyl methionine are both uh, down. So evidently, in both of these models, which are long-lived, uh, there's an association of reduced folate and methionine pools. 
So it's really striking that uh, now that we have a pathway, uh, methionine restriction is working across many different longevity pathways across evolution, and it really begs the question, well, how does methionine restriction then impact lifespan? And this could be through many different mechanisms which have uh, previously been associated with longevity, including protein synthesis, so methionine itself, of course, is important for protein synthesis. Esadenosyl methionine is important for the processing of ribosomal RNA. It's also a positive effector of the mTOR pathway. Uh, it's involved in the decoration of histones and DNA. Um, we've all heard about DNA methylation clocks. Perhaps there's a connection between folate metabolism and DNA methylation clock. As well, um, there are transsulfuration reactions which have been uh, associated with longevity, including the production of H2 S gas and glutathione. And so we think with the power of C. elegans genetics, we can begin to unravel uh, some of these pathways. It should be noted that people take um, antifolate uh, drugs uh, as, as a treatment for autoimmunity diseases. And some of these, uh, some of the meta-analysis suggests that some of these patients show better outcomes for unrelated diseases such as heart disease. So perhaps a modest reduction of the folate pathway can have general health benefits. So then to summarize, uh, multiple longevity pathways regulate folate and methionine cycle intermediates as part of a convergent me mechanism, and that DHFR1, RNAi, and 5-methyl-THF uh, uh, can regulate uh, multiple longevity pathways. And it, I think this really highlights how single genes and single metabolites can have a profound effect on animal lifespan and health span and reveals the power of metabolomic profiles as a resource to really uh, identify novel uh, interventions that can impact health and life. And with that, I'd like to thank the people who did this work, Andrea uh, and a number of uh, his uh, assistants, including um, a very uh, talented students, uh, uh, Mary Bell Schoenewolf, Hannah Tam, Marcus Auler, uh, and Christian Latza, as well as my collaborators, Linda Partridge, Sebastian Grunke, sources of funding, and my fantastic lab. And yeah, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Adam, for a very interesting talk. Maybe we can first have a look to Slack. So, Wilbert Ferme, he's asking both caloric restriction, mTOR and IGF mechanisms, but also folate cycle and methionine are evolutionary well-conserved pathways. Do you think that in mice, um, primates, these mechanisms also converge on folate? Well, I think our evidence uh, suggests that, at least in mice, with the insulin IGF signaling pathway, the answer is yes. We haven't explored other pathways, but it certainly would be interesting to look. Do we have a question in the audience? Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, the homocysteine observation is really interesting because in humans there's a lot of epidemiologic evidence that suggests elevated homocysteine is really associated with poor outcomes, particularly yeah. in cardiovascular disease. So I'm just wondering, did you ever look into the effect of supplementing homocysteine alone on like lifespan or health span measures in the worms? Yeah, we haven't, and I think it would be a great idea to do so. I think it's, you know, often you have to realize that most of that is based on serum homocysteine. So we don't really know what's happening within the tissues and what impact that has within the tissues. But you're absolutely right. Um, homocysteine is associated with poor outcomes in cardiovascular disease. So I think there's a lot of complexity here. And I think the fine tuning of these pathways will be important. And they obviously are not linear pathways. They're very branched. And so um, I think, uh, Again, um, if we're going to target these pathways, we have to understand uh, where they're going. But what I find quite striking here, and this was for us to some extent quite unexpected, was the huge you know, effect of, uh, that we saw on s methionine. methionine. And um, it's not something we were looking for, but it seems to be, it doesn't quite reach significance across all the pathways, but it seems that it's down in, in most. So I think that's you know, that's probably the target that we want to focus on. OK, 
Okay, and then we have one more question from Morton. As adenosyl methionine can spontaneously induce mutagenic lesions in DNA, could a reduction in SAM contribute to longevity in your model? Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that could very well be. Um, you know, we, we hadn't thought about the mutagenic effect, and that, that could be one reason why we see better health outcomes. Um, what I find intriguing is the, trying to make the connection perhaps to the DNA methylation age because I think we don't really understand why it is that methylation events are changing with aging and perhaps it's intimately tied to the folate cycle. Um, whether that's also tied to mutagenic properties in, in, in DNA I think is a really interesting question. Okay, thanks Adam. Maybe we can give another applause to Adam. Thank you very much.